Hello, welcome to a new Mini Meet the Master Homeschool Art. So today we're talking about the work of the father of modern sculpture, Auguste Rodin. He was born in 1840, he died in 1917, and he was French. So here's an arrow pointing at France on the world map. Here's an arrow pointing at Paris. He uh, was born in Paris and he died in Modin, a suburb of Paris. So he uh, lived most of his life in Paris. He was born into a working class family. His family wasn't artistic. He, his dad was a, a police department clerk. He started drawing. He did try and get into the big art school in Paris, tried and failed three times. Uh, instead went to a different school that kind of bought to kind of uh, taught more practical art so he kind of became a craftsman an ornamenter he made kind of decorative objects for houses and architectural embellishments uh, this portrait of Rodin by the way is by John Singer Sargent who's a very famous painter in his own right so some words to know the first is sculpture so sculpture is a three-dimensional work of art. Most of the art we have looked at has been painting, so it's, uh, you know, two-dimensional. It has width, it has height, it doesn't have depth. So sculpture has that third dimension depth to it. An artist who creates sculpture is called a sculptor. And the way these bronze pieces that we're going to be looking at are created is through a process called casting. And kind of in very simple terms, imagine you have a seashell and you take some Play-Doh and you push the seashell into the Play-Doh and then you pull the seashell out. You now have an imprint of that seashell in the Play-Doh. Now, if you were to fill that imprint with, you know, resin or plaster of Paris or wax and let it harden, then you could peel the Play-Doh away and what is left would be a replica of the seashell that you started with. So. That's kind of the idea behind casting. You start with an original that's made like from wax or plaster or clay. Uh, it's surrounded with molding material. Um, then the mold gets most often like split in half. The original is taken out and then uh, it's filled with the material the final sculpture is going to be in. In this case, that's bronze. So bronze is a metal alloy. That means a mixture of two metals in this case it's copper and tin and here you can see a another mold for a sculpture um, you can see you know how these two halves are put together and then they're filled with the material for the sculpture which in Rodin's case was molten bronze and then that is allowed to cool and harden and then the mold is taken off and the sculpture is revealed so this is one of the first pieces we have by Rodin. It's called Man with a Broken Nose. And it was just somebody he met in the street, um, like a, I think it was like a street vendor. And he has very lived in face. He's wrinkly you know, forehead, kind of saggy cheeks, and he had a broken nose. And so this wasn't somebody that would normally have been portrayed in sculpture. Sculpture at the time was very much about the mythological, the heroic, uh, kind of amazing feats perfect human specimens and and this this guy was just human and so Rodin used the sculpture to apply to the art school in Paris and got rejected uh, also it doesn't have a back of the head because it got really cold in Rodin's studio and uh, the plaster model that that he made the, the back of the head it actually cracked off and so it doesn't have a back of the head so then, now we're almost two decades later, Rodin had just gotten his first big commission that was going to be a lengthy project, but he wasn't very well known yet. And so a friend of his uh, suggested that he maybe get somebody famous to sit for him so he could create a bust of somebody famous. And the person who agreed to do it was uh, Victor Hugo, very well-known writer. Uh, he wrote things like The Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, and Les Miserables. And so, uh, very, very well known. And Rodin got to sketch him and then he would rush into the next room and, and quickly try and do a, a model uh, in clay from what he remembered. 
from the sketch and from his memory. So he created this bust of Victor Hugo and it worked for him. Because two years later when uh, Victor Hugo died, uh, Rodin was actually commissioned to create a, a monument uh, to Victor Hugo. And so this is the, the final monument. This, this is a smaller version of it. It's a, a bigger, more elaborate piece, but, but you get the idea. So one of his most well-known pieces is the Burgers of Calais. And that one uh, commemorated an episode during the Hundred Year War where Calais, which is the city in the north of uh, France, we take the ferry over to England, so it's kind of the closest to England, um, was under siege by the, the, the English. And uh, the principal citizens of the town were ordered to come out uh, yeah, the heads and their feet are bare, they have ropes around their neck, they're kind of in tatters, and they're in like just oh, despair because they were led before the English king, Edward III, who ordered their beheading. Um, little did they know that they were not going to die. They actually were saved by the intercession of the English queen, Philippa. But uh, Rodin does this amazing job of showing all these things these despairing emotional faces. So again, as we said, it's it's a, it, it's cast from a model, so you can make multiple casts. You can reuse uh, the molds or make new molds um, and, and create the same object several times. So uh, the Burgers of Calais actually exist in different versions all around the world. So 12 original castings were made at the time, and then numerous copies have been made. So here is a close-up of one of the faces of one of the burgers. Now that's not a hamburger, it's B-U-R-G-H-E-R, -E and it's just an, an old word that kind of means citizen. Um, so you can look at the difference there between Rodin's work and kind of the, the classical sculpture. So that's a um, close-up of Michelangelo's David from the Renaissance. Yeah, but if you look at Greek and Roman sculpture, you will see the same kind of superhuman beauty and perfection. And the, Rodin kind of brought sculpture into the modern age, but just focusing on the human element. You see the despair there. It's not trying to be perfect. It's not trying to display a perfect human being. It just shows a human being. Um, and you can see uh, his maker's marks, you know, where he, he sculpted the material. He didn't try to smooth everything out perfectly. You can see Rodin's hand in the process there. So this one is the London copy. And then this is, I think it's really interesting because you can see all the figures were uh, cast separately and then the, the bases aligned to form the complete piece. But uh, this is the copy of at Stanford University. And as you can see, it's uh, they, they've decided to kind of pull the figures apart and display them in a different way. And you get a very different feeling from that. So I think that's really interesting. This is one of my favorite pieces by Rodin. I just think it's so beautiful and elegant and tender. It's called the cathedral because the, the hands, which are two right hands, um, kind of form this vaulted ceiling, kind of like the Gothic cathedrals in France. But uh, the the one on the left was carved in marble. Uh, the one on the right was cast in bronze. Now, uh, Rodin actually never carved anything in marble. Uh, he did pose for some photos with a chisel and a hammer, acting like he was carving things in marble, but he actually never did. Um, he would model in clay or plaster, and then he would actually hire people to do the actual uh, chiseling out of stone or um, do the casting. So this piece is called The Gates of Hell and it's based on an, an epic poem by Dante called The Inferno, kind of a classic piece of literature. Um, kind of shows like the seven circles of hell. And this was uh, commissioned for museum in Paris it stands about 18 feet tall, so it's huge, and uh, Rodin worked on this for about a decade. In 1890, he kind of set it aside. He didn't get it finished because there was just too much stuff to do, and it didn't actually get assembled into the door until uh, much later. 
but from about 1880 to 1890, he worked on the store. And the figure at the top there that's circled, that became the base for his most famous work of art called The Thinker. And just a word of caution here, if your family objects to nudity, uh, the thinker is a nude. Now it's very roughly rendered and I've selected the shots so it doesn't show anything. <laughs> but be warned, uh, I'm going to show some more pictures of the thinker. If, if that isn't for your family, that is perfectly fine. Just pause the video here and fast forward to the art tutorial at the end. So otherwise, hold on to your seats. We're going on to the thinker. Here is a close-up of the version in the door. And so the thinker exists in three sizes. You have the small kind of door-sized version, then you have a life-sized version, and then you have a monumental version that's much bigger than life-size. So this is one of the monumental versions. So you, you can kind of see his build here. You have this very strong uh, muscular body, but he's not using that body and normally in Greek sculpture you have like the disc thrower and this it's all about the body this this is more about the mind uh it, it shows him thinking very deeply lost in thought and with this very uh kind of far away look in his eyes so here's a version that was actually made from marble we're down owned about 6,000 pieces of classical Greek and Roman sculpture. Uh, he was fascinated by it and it, it inspired his work, but then he decided to give it a much more modern, much more human twist. And when Rodin died in 1917, he was buried, uh, the, that's his house in Laurent, and he's buried in the front yard with his wife. On the left you see the gravestone and the thinker uh, he asked for the thinker to become his headstone for his grave. So the thinker is uh, on Rodin's grave. It was basically his last word. Okay, so now that you've learned a little bit about Rodin, let's go on and make a piece of sculpture of our own. So to make our sculpture, I'm just going to use some aluminum foil. So just go grab whatever aluminum foil you have, and I'm going to start with a pretty big piece, and I'm going to kind of fold it up. So I'm going to, you can actually make whatever you want from your aluminum foil, so if you want to make an animal, or um, an abstract, or anything you want. I'm, I'm going to try and make a person, we'll see how it goes. So uh, I'm going to fold this in half. And then I'm going to take another piece here, and that's going to become my arm. I'm going to roll it up kind of here. And I'm going to stick this through the middle here, where I think the arm should be. And then I'm going to crunch this up and kind of start creating my head. Crunch this up to make the arm. And then I do have two pieces here that can become the legs. But I'm going to put another piece of foil just around the middle, kind of to tie those together. So this is going to be my main body. And then I'm going to have one leg on the left, one on the left. So there's my different shape. So now I can um, start working on making this piece um, a little more what I want it to be. So I can grab some scissors. If I think my leg arms are too long, I can just cut them to the length I want them to be. And same with the legs, cut them the same distance. Now I can just go and add pieces of foil. Let's say I want to make some feet. That's a nice thing about aluminum foil. You know, it kind of holds onto its, itself quite well. So there's one of my feet. You 
You can even make uh, clothing for your sculpture. <laughs> now, if I wanted to, you know, I could pose him. There you go. Let me go. Hmm. I have kind of created my own little version of the thinker and I'm just gonna sit him on a rock here there you go what do you think <laughs> anyway, have fun with this and uh, if you make your own sculpture go ahead and uh, send me a picture I would love it at bphelps at bye-bye